everyone and welcome to Study Travel TV Live, a show of news, statistics and opinion. I'm Nicola Hancock's editor of Study Travel Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Joshua Walton, staff journalist at Study Travel Magazine. Before we get started, before the best viewing experience, please put the call in side by side speaker view. You'll see an icon in the top right hand corner where you can select the view. We are delighted to welcome you all today to the latest episode of Study Travel TV Live. In today's broadcast, we'll start with a new story and then we will be joined by our guests this week, Heidi Valenga, Executive Director, Commission on English Language Programme Accreditation, and Jessica Wu, Managing Director of IVU Education in China. We'll then introduce a few more stories as we go through the show. If you have any questions for the presenters or guest speakers or comments on the stories, please post them in the chat box and we will read them out at the end of the show. A big thank you to the sponsor of this episode, Felka. One more thing before we start. Um, during this broadcast, we'll be running a prize draw. Uh, one lucky viewer will be randomly chosen to receive a choice of study travel prizes, including free event attendance, accommodation, or a free sponsorship or advertising package. In order to be in the prize draw, all you have to do is keep watching until the end of the broadcast. OK, then let's have a look at our first story this week. The latest Open Doors report by the Institute of International Education has shown that overall international student enrolments at higher education institutions decreased by 15% in 2020 2021 to 914,000, the lowest total since 2013 2014. The data includes students physically in the USA and those studying online in their own countries but holding a valid student visa. The biggest COVID-19 impact was apparent in new first year enrolments, which declined by 45.6% to 145,000, the lowest intake for 16 years. All of the top 25 source countries declined in 2020-21, most of them by double digits, while China remained the top source country, accounting for one third of all students. IIE said that 45% of international students in 2020-2021 attended in-person classes on campus at some point of the year, with the remainder studying online in the USA or overseas. 86% of the total number of international students were already enrolled and in the country prior to the pandemic. However, a snapshot survey of 860 higher education institutions on the current 2021-22 year suggested a recovery with a 68% increase in first year enrolments, both online and in person, compared with the previous year for those institutions. In the snapshot survey, IIE found that more than two thirds of institutions are committing the same resources or more to student recruitment efforts in the current year. IIE also revealed to Study Travel magazine that 48% of those institutions surveyed are working with agents to boost recruitment. So at this point, we'd like to introduce our guests, Heidi and Jessica. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, Heidi. You've been with uh, CEA team since 2014 and CEA itself is celebrating 20 years of leadership and accreditation in the study travel field. Um, the 68% increase in first year enrolments in that snapshot survey just then can be seen as a rebound perhaps. Uh, do you have any evidence that IEPs have similarly recovered in this current academic year for those who have actually traveled to the USA for some courses? We have some anecdotal confirmation that numbers are returning, um, not quite back to normal, but schools are welcoming more in-person students. Uh, the way CEA collects its data is based on calendar year enrollment. And so we showed a similar uh, profile of about a 15% decline in student weeks in calendar year 2020. And we'll collect that information from our accredited sites next February for the 2021 year. But we do see, um, since the consulates are open and visas are being reissued, we have heard anecdotally from many of our sites that they have increased uh, in-person enrollment this fall. That's good news. Um, and how important is the online cohort to the universities now? And will online courses continue in the future, do you think? 
uh, I think a lot of uh, programs, particularly university based programs that had been uh, somewhat resistant to online English language education were surprised to discover that they were very good at delivering online instruction and that it could be successful, particularly with the arrays of technological advances and support that we have uh, at our disposal these days. Um, it seems that there's still quite a preference for in-person instruction. We have uh, fielded about 35 inquiries about permanently adding distance ed to the scope of accreditation uh, from our sites, and that represents about 10% of our overall number of accredited programs and institutions. Um, okay, and uh, to what extent um, is this 68% increase in students based on those that deferred from the previous year when the pandemic was at its height? It's really hard to say um, of that percentage, but I, I have heard from our accredited program directors that uh, there's a real eagerness to come to campus and a lot of students had been, you know, studying online uh, while waiting for their visa documents to come through. Thank you. And Jessica, your main IVU markets for tertiary studies are the USA, Canada, the UK, Switzerland and Singapore. How is the demand for the USA compared to the others right now? And what factors do you think might be influencing this? Yes, uh, there did have some decrease for the US destinations, but the demand for top ranking US universities is still the same, even uh, there's a much bigger increase in that application because uh, most Chinese students, they lack the top ranking universities, especially for the uh, top 30 U US news ranking universities. Um, so they, they, they thought uh, for the COVID-19, they're much less competitive. So many of them, they would like to send applications to that university to, to to they want to get the office and meanwhile comparing to to other destinations we we found a huge increase for the UK destinations um, because I from our survey we found that there are two main reasons for the student they want to uh, choose the UK universities for, uh, first thing is uh, is the China's who call policy uh, because most the Chinese students, they want to have some, uh, they, they want to have the uh, hukou in Beijing, Shanghai. Um, in these two areas, the student, they have a, a top ranking university degree certificate. So the student would, would normally uh, like to choose the top ranking UK and uh, USA universities. Uh, meanwhile, if they want to get the good job opportunities, they, they should get the top ranking university because uh, the Chinese large enterprises, they normally will recruit students uh, from the top 100 QS ranking, TEMS ranking, or the ARWU ranking. So, so that that's my uh, opinion yeah comparing to to the united states and uh, meanwhile uh, for the top ranking uk universities the entry requirements is relatively looser than than the us and uh, meanwhile uh, for the uk universities uh, normally their bachelor's degree is only three years comparing to the united states uh, it's four years so yeah, most of the Chinese students, they, they would like to come to choose to study in the UK rather than the United States. Thank you. And the open doors data also points to the perseverance of students who were already enrolled when the pandemic started. Indeed, there was a decrease of only 3% in continuing students. Jessica, did your students mostly stay in their destinations throughout or did they return home and study online? Yeah, last year, most of the students will return home 
to study online, but comparing to last year, uh, because they did not get the good results. So uh, from this September, uh, even August, most of the people, they would like to uh, start a border directly. And meanwhile, because uh, the Canada and the United States, they opened their borders. So the student would like to come out to stay uh, the online and offline classes in, in the desolation country. Thank you. Okay, let's take another story. Spain ranked highest for international student satisfaction in 2021, according to the latest Global Student Satisfaction Report released by study portals, based on reviews by 45,604 international students. Amongst destinations with at least 200 reviews, Spain scored highest with an average score of 4.33 out of a possible five points. Among the major English language speaking higher education destinations, the UK ranked the highest at seventh with a score of 4.2, while the USA was 15th on 4.11. Overall student satisfaction based on 108,000 reviews by international and domestic students declined to 4.06 in the 2021 report, down from 4.21 in the previous survey. Satisfaction with online learning was the lowest scoring element of the reviews at 3.6 and was lower still for bachelor students. However, student satisfaction with institutions handling of the COVID-19 pandemic was higher at 4.15. Jessica, clearly this is a very subjective process and students are not comparing destinations, just scoring the one that they are in. Spain and most of the top five based on international student reviews were low cost options with relatively few students. Do you think the higher fees in the likes of the UK and the USA would raise expectations among students and cause the lower satisfaction marks? Uh, I don't think so, because it would depend on the students' over expectations or in preferences and their consumption capacities. Uh, for example, uh, some, some students, they want to study uh, in a whole English-speaking environment. So even some Spain or German, it's a no-cost desolation, but they, they want to that. Okay, thank you. Um, everybody involved in the in the sector worked hard to make online learning work during the pandemic um, as a matter of necessity. Uh, nonetheless, that lower satisfaction score for online learning suggests students much prefer face to face and or in country teaching. So, Jessica, how have your students uh, reacted to offers that are online only? Um, yes, most of them can only. Uh, get the online courses at home, but some UK or US universities, they can work with the Chinese universities to, to deliver some uh, online merge offline classes in China campus. Thank you. And Heidi, what is the current situation with CEA accredited English language providers? Um, have CEA developed accreditation specifically for online English language courses? So um, throughout the pandemic, we were able to take advantage of the flexibilities offered by the two main federal agencies to which we uh, report the US Department of Education, but also the Student Exchange and Visitor Program, which allowed for a quick and full transition to online education throughout the impact of the pandemic. And so the majority of our sites uh, did transition to online instruction with notification to us of their revised procedures. Uh, we have established this year a distance education task force and the commission has approved uh, for us to formally include distance education within our scope of rec recognition with the US Department of Education. So uh, while we don't see a big interest in schools permanently adding online instruction, we anticipate that that will be an option in the future for schools that which wish to deliver solely online instruction. To sum up, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Okay, let's move on to another story. Um, the US Immigrations and Customs Enforcement has confirmed that 
electronic signatures on the form I-20, uh, the Certificate of Eligibility for Non-Immigrant Student Status, and electronic transmission to students can become permanent practice. The Student and Exchange Visitor Programme requires designated school officials to sign the Form I-20 before issuing the form to students and their dependents. The Form I-20 is required before a student can apply for an F1 or an M1 student visa. Due to disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, SEVP authorised the use of electronic signatures on Form I-20s by DSO and electronic transmission of the form to students and has now confirmed this is a permanent policy. Heidi, this was one of Study Travel News's most top-read um, stories of the last week, so it's clearly generated a lot, a lot of interest among our readers. What practical difference do you think this policy change will have on prospective students and the ease with which they can apply for a visa to come and study in the USA? Well, it's something that I know that uh, the industry has been pushing for for many years. Uh, it was sort of an outdated uh, uh, you know, what signature that required a uh, mailing address and in different international locations, receiving mail can be difficult, if not impossible. It also was an increased cost that was passed on to students to mail their application packets, including Forms I-20, and sometimes uh, prevented a delay in obtaining uh, an interview slot at the local consulate or embassy. So uh, I think there's great uh, relief and happiness that this policy has moved from a temporary sort of COVID related solution to a permanent practice. And I think the advantage will be, you know, speed at which schools can issue forms I-20 and get them in the hands of students. And then also the, the reduced maybe processing time um, that it might have taken to get those documents um, signed physically. Absolutely. And Jessica, you work with the US market. How do you think continuing with electronic signatures on the I-20 will help your agency? And how straightforward is the US visa system compared with other study destinations? Yes, uh, this policy will help us to, to uh, help the student to get the visa as soon as possible. And it also saves a lot of time for the students. Uh, for example, uh, currently um, the, the Chengdu US Council, the Council, the US Consulate in Chengdu was closed last year. And all, all of us can only go to Beijing, Shanghai and the Guangzhou because uh, currently I'm based in Chengdu, the Southwest of China. Uh, uh, for this policy, just like our current students, they came back to China last year and they uh, took the online lessons at home or they just uh, stopped their courses uh, from last year to, to this August. And from this September, uh, especially for this new policy, uh, they can continue to study uh, their courses um, from, uh, that means, uh, how can I say that? Um, they can easily uh, get the entry clearance uh, to to United States without going to the consulate. So uh, it saves a lot of time. Uh, comparing, uh, because U UK is a pop popular destination currently, but comparing to the U US visa system, I really love the US visa system rather than the UK. Uh, firstly, save us a lot of time because we can get the visa results when they just take the interview at the same day or just in seven days we can get the results and the second thing the you not the u.s uh, visa application fee is much cheaper than the uk to be honest i really love sending a student to u.s rather than uk at, at this point <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, let's take another story. Uh, the UK's Department for Transport has announced that all COVID-19 vaccines on the WHO emergency use list will be recognised for arrival in England and that all under 18s arriving from anywhere will be treated as fully vaccinated at the border later this month. The government confirmed that its recognised vaccine list will be expanded from November 22nd to recognise those on the World Health Organization's emergency use list, which includes vaccines such as Sinovac, Sinopharm Beijing and Covaxin. 
adult passengers who have been fully vaccinated and have received vaccine certificates from one or of more than 135 approved countries and territories are not required to take a pre-departure test and don't need to self-isolate. The Department for Transport will simplify travel rules for all under 18s from November 22nd, meaning that they will be treated as vaccinated and exempt from self-isolation requirements. Under 18s will be required to take a lateral flow test after arrival. Jessica, this must be good news for your high school students and for many other agencies around the world who send young students to England. How does this new border policy for under 18s compare to other destinations where you send high school students such as South Korea and the USA? And will it help you attract students to England? Uh, yeah, that would be beneficial for us to attract students to study in UK. Um, because I do the UK and the USA high school placement from um, 2012, comparing to the United States and the UK. Uh, to be honest, just uh, previously, I said I really like sending students to United States, but I like sending students to, uh, to study in United States universities, but comparing to the high school, uh, I would like to send students to UK rather than the United States because there are some reasons. First, because in UK, most of the schools, uh, they can accept the boarding students. But comparing to the United States, the boarding school is very competitive for Chinese students to, to get the offer. And secondly, um, because some safety issues, the United States is very big, and the UK is, is com comparatively small, smaller than the United States. So um, some uh, chi Chinese parents, they, thought, they, they think the UK would be uh, more safer than the United States. So uh, because, uh, for this COVID-19, um, from last year, all of our high school students, they came back to China and they did not get a good school. So most Chinese parents, they, they would like to send their kids to, to study in the UK this September for the boarding school students. But for the United States, uh, many factors, the COVID-19 and even some political issues. So uh, for, for many things, the U from last year, UK did not close its border and the UK uh, introduced many uh, measures to pack, protect the students' uh, sick issues. So yeah, um, from, from this year, many students they would like to study in the UK boarding schools. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Heidi, uh, congratulations for the role CEA played in encouraging the recent joint statement of principles in support of international education by the Department of State and the Department of Education. In that statement, the departments mentioned that in 2020, international students contributed over $39 billion to the US economy, making US education the nation's sixth largest services export, supporting an estimated 415,000 American jobs. It's high time uh, that we heard such positive comments and actions from government, isn't it? Yeah, this was a, a really interesting initiative. And I noticed that Cheryl Delk Legood, who's the executive director of English USA, is on this uh, in the audience today. Um, CEA as an accreditor needs to be very careful about not advocating or making any kind of political statements. But we felt that including the English language program sector in this sort of renewed commitment to international uh, accreditation international education at the higher education level was really uh, important. And I think, you know, as an accreditor, we represent not only our accredited schools in the US, but we accredit programs and institutions and binational centers across the world. So our commitment is really to the English language education sector. And we're, um, working closely with those our sister professional organizations, including English USA and USEEP, which is the University and College Intensive English Program Consortium uh, and NAFSA to really uh, spearhead some of those events. But you know, for 
for us as a specialized accreditor focusing exclusively on English language training, we really want to recognize the important impact that that English language training plays to uh, higher education in the US in, in general. Great, thank you. Um, time for one more story. Uh, the agent perceptions of Australia and New Zealand have reached their lowest point since the beginning of the pandemic, while confidence in the UK and Canada remains high and the USA is catching up, according to the latest survey by global pathway provider Navitas. Fourth edition of the Navitas Agent Perception Survey, which has tracked attitudes of the five major English speaking higher education destinations through the COVID-19 pandemic, is based on responses from 1,051 agents in 77 countries. Agents were asked to agree or disagree with the statement, over the past two months, the way this country's government has handled coronavirus has made it a more attractive study destination. In March 2020, more than 80% of agents agreed with this statement for Australia and New Zealand, figures that have fallen to 30 and 33% respectively in the latest October 2021 edition. In contrast, other destination scores have steadily improved, led by Canada at 79% and the UK with 75%. Jessica, do you agree with this finding? Um, from your business perspective, uh, which country has best handled the COVID-19 pandemic? And is this going to affect students' choices going forward into 2022? Yes, I agree with this finding. And I think UK will be the best to handle the COVID-19 pandemic uh, because the border di didn't close even the situation is not good. And also the uh, most uh, British, they just uh, took the vaccination and parents and the students, they, they just feel they, they will be safe in UK. So yeah. We, we, we have a lot of Chinese students who want to study in UK from last year to this year and next year. Thank you. And Heidi, what do you think the USA needs to do to improve its perception among agents worldwide as an attractive study destination? Well, I, I think the joint, the response to the joint statement that we just made, um, that we just discussed, I think is, is a good step in the right direction to have kind of a coordinated federal strategy or national strategy towards promoting international education. Um, to Jessica's comments, you know, regions of the US and our uh, focus on state sovereignty have resulted in really different ways of managing the pandemic. And so um, I think, a more centralized approach uh, would benefit international students overall. Um, and I think, you know, there is some interest in the departments of commerce in creating sort of a national trade strategy based on the numbers that you referenced earlier, Nicola, with education being our fifth biggest export. Thank you. And that brings us up to date with all the news and goings on in the industry. At this point, we'll completely open up to the audience to see if there are any questions for our guests or for the study travel team. These can be on any of the stories or topics we've discussed today. Do please make sure that your organisation and your name are in your Zoom name or in the question you post. So I'll just have a quick look. And there are some comments in there, but it doesn't seem we have any questions in the box. There were a couple that we had previously sent in to us for the show. Um, so if we start with you, Heidi, uh, so do the latest Navitas agent perception survey results in the higher education sector reflect the experience of agents in the language teaching sector, do you think? Do you think the, um, the perception is kind of translatable across, across both sectors? Or do you think the higher education is, is kind of more severely impacted? I think, um, you, you know, in general, in the United States, the perception of working with agents is quite variable, depending on the context of the particular program or institution. Uh, but I do think that there is an increased interest in working with agents and that um, English language 
students, particularly from Europe um, and certain Asian countries are coming to the US through agents. Um, in, in terms of the, the perception, I think, I think it's fairly accurate. The issue with English programs is oftentimes that the student's duration of study is shorter. And so it, it's sort of the amount of work that the agent puts forth is equivalent, but for a, a lesser return on investment from their perspective. Thank you. And Jessica, would you have anything to add to that? Um, the, mm -hmm. the kind of perception and the the change or how it compares with the, the higher education sector, the language sector? Uh, for the language sector, um, because for, for my company and for my work experience, I send a student mainly for the degree study. Uh, yes, uh, for, for the language study to United States or even the UK or other countries, um, Mm, there might be uh, less needs for, for my market. Yeah, I, I think I cannot give you convincing uh, comments for that. Yeah. Okay, I have another uh, question actually from the from the floor, Jessica. So uh, mm -hmm. we're aware this, um, um, I think it's from someone based in the US. We're aware that Chinese students are most interested in top universities in the US for degree study. And do you think this is true, however, for language programs? Um, so the desire to attend programs at top schools, so language pro or language programs at top universities? Yes, because um, it's different uh, for UK and the United States language program because in UK, the students do not have the uh, sufficient language to, uh, score to to when they do the application. Uh, for example, if the uh, Imperial College, uh, their language requirements is seven, the IELTS seven, so they can just send other applications and get a conditional offer. And even the student can only get a I was uh, 6.5, so they can take the processional course to combine their main course. But comparing to the United States, if the student, they want to make, applica make applications for the top ranking universities, first thing they need to have a sufficient uh, language score. So different uh, for, for, my, for my work experience. So, Mm, because Chinese universities, they do like top ranking universities because most of them, they want to come back to China and they want to uh, mm, have a good, uh, because they want to get the job offer from the big enterprises. And also they want to have the hukou in Beijing or Shanghai because uh, this region, if they want to have the hukou, so they, they uh, get the, Top ranking universities degree. So this is main, main points for Chinese students why they want to have the top ranking universities overseas. But some some students, if they really want to uh, study overseas and they want stay there, for example, Canada and Australia or New Zealand, so they do not care about the university ranking. They only care about the uh, some budget issue or the location, the local environment. So different perspective, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I don't think we've got any more from the floor. Um, there is something about the East signature being good news, um, but is this applicable to all students or just students from certain regions? Would you be able to answer that, Heidi? With the caveat that I, you know, don't speak for SEVP or represent them, I think the electronic signature is valid for all incoming students, and it's the interview waiver that's only happening at certain consulates and embassies in certain countries. So there's 
uh, you know, the, the numbers of visas being issued are now back sort of up to pre-pandemic levels. And I think in large part that's due to that limited number of countries that are eligible to exempt students from aspects of that required student interview that was implemented post 9-11. Great, thank you for, for answering answering that. And they've given a thumbs up. So they, <laughs> they appreciate appreciate your your reply. Um, we did just have another a backup question. Again, it was just returning to the IIE snapshot survey that revealed 48% of US institutions were working with agents to, to boost recruitment. So for you, Jessica, has this been your experience? Do you think that the number of agents working with institutions in the US, in, in your market specifically, has been growing? Do you think they, that the institutions over there are, being, are, are more willing to work with agents to, to get students into their into their institutions? Yes, uh, comparing to the UK and, Aust and Australia, New Zealand, uh, they can gain the market. I think the one of the most important factors is that they can work with the agency. Uh, because chi Chinese students, it's uh, are very special because even we, uh, I. I joined this industry 13 years ago. Uh, even some, some agencies, they provide the free consultation, uh, consultation and uh, free services to help the students to do the university application. But finally we found, we spend a lot of time to talk with the family, to talk with students, to give them the guidance, even the explanation why they choose this university and uh, which university or which region or uh, what kind of subject is beneficial for them for, for their future or the study plan, the career plan. So for the university cooperation with us, it's better for all of us because they can just let us know their standing point. Mm, how can I suggest that? Because we, we need to know every university's shining point not standing point yeah so uh we 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 would know we we will know the uh students needs so comparing to the students needs even the student didn't know them very well so they lead us we can provide them professional consultation and to give them the professional study plan for them great yeah. brilliant thank you very much yeah. Um, I think that's the the end of the uh, of our audience Q and A. I can't see any more uh, questions, which brings us to the end of this week's Study Travel TV Live. Now it's time the time you've all been waiting for. Let's announce this week's winner of the prize, and the winner is, I believe. Carlos Vico or Vicio. Um, we don't have a company name, um, but if he can stay on the call, we can grab um, your contact details. So that was Carlos, Carlos Vico. Um, congratulations. You have a choice of prizes worth around £400, including digital advertising options, sponsorship, and hotel accommodation. Um, tune in in live to the next week's uh, episode on, uh, on December 1st for another chance to win the prize draw or visit the Study Travel television, uh, TV live page on Study Travel Network, which you can find under the magazine section in the menu, where we'll be announcing the guest speakers for the next broadcast, as well as a recording of this episode and past episodes. Finally, we'd like to say a big thank you to our special guests. Heidi, thank you for your time and insights today. Thank you for having us. And Jessica, thank you for joining us from China. And thank you so much for your input. We look forward to seeing you both again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Me. And thank you again to our sponsor this week, Felka. Thank you everyone for watching and goodbye. Goodbye.